you think about Napoleon, you obviously think about the great battles. You're thinking about Austerlitz, Borodino and the retreat from Moscow, the Battle of Waterloo. But Napoleon was so much more than just a conqueror, an emperor. He was a man, he was a lover, and he had an extraordinary love life. In particular, historians, and frankly all of us, have been obsessed over the centuries with Napoleon's tempestuous, his passionate, his deeply complicated love life with his wife, Josephine. And that marriage and their traumatic divorce plays centre stage in the extraordinary new Ridley Scott Napoleon, which features not only some of the most remarkable battle scenes ever filmed, but a picture, an image of this relationship that runs right the way through Napoleon's career. And to get to the bottom of the real history behind all that, I'm going to talk to the brilliant sex historian, Dr. Kate Lister. He seems to be like absolutely devoted to this woman. You're a vile, mean, beastly slut. She had an affair with a lower level army guy. I'm creeping towards the position that insecure men should not be allowed to wield the power of life and death over the rest of us. Hey Kate, welcome to the show. Hi Dan, thank you for inviting me onto the show. Napoleon did not have an easy tween age, early teenage life, right? It was rough for him, it was rough. He was quite awkward, he was quite clunky, is sort of the only word that I can think yeah. of, is when people... Very relatable. <laughs> when people clunky. write about him, he's kind of scruffy, he's kind of awkward, he doesn't quite fit in, and it's not just the accent that makes him stand out and the fact that he does, I mean, by our, it's not quite an impoverished background, but by the standards of the people he was running with, yeah. he was practically a peasant. That all made him stand out, but he was also, he wasn't great at talking to people. He wasn't, he wasn't blessed with like the gift of the gab and endless charm. Okay, I'm gonna come to an expert here. Was he successful? Well, in thankfully. His first, in his first romantic adventures? He writes a lot in his diaries. So we have got the sources about his earliest sexual encounters. And like many young men in France, Napoleon lost his virginity in a brothel. Huh. Um, but what's interesting about it is he seems to have a real aversion to sex and sexuality. He is really uncomfortable around it, whereas his peers were just, you know, like, let, let's go, let's do it. You can't get them out of the brothel. He writes about it that he's really upset that he's that he can't stay away from this debauchery is the word that he uses. He's quite serious minded, isn't he? Very serious. He thinks he thinks he's one of the a, a great world historical figure, even as a teenager. Yep. And therefore, like, what the physicality, the muckiness of sex is kind of freaking he him out. He thinks mucky is a good word for it. He thinks, but he's also desperately attracted to it. So the, the time he manages to lose his virginity, he picks up um, a sex worker on the street and he writes about this in his diary like he's recording an experiment. It's the weirdest thing. And the way he talks to her, and this is from his own perspective, this is his best slant on it. You read it and you just think, you are a strange, strange duck, Napoleon. So he goes up to this, first of all, he spots her and he thinks that she's more bashful than all of the others. So that appeals to okay. him, right? And then he says, he says that, that he's usually disgusted by them, them, that he's usually like so revolted that even look at him, he feels sick. But for some reason this time, he's gonna, he's gonna go for it. So he goes over to her and his opening line is, don't you think you could be doing something better to earn your living? <laughs> it's like, and he then proceeds to interrogate about where did you come from? How did you end up like this? Would you like to be doing something else? And then he finishes it off with this weird phrasing of like, let's go back to my hotel so you can get your satisfaction or something. <sighs> like, Treat yourself. Right, exactly. <laughs> you, you lucky, lucky girl getting to what have a, a go on this. And he was a virgin and he just, he draws a kind of a discreet veil over it about exactly what happens, but that's... That's how he lost his virginity, just going up to this this girl on the street and going, you could be doing something better else with your time. Do you fancy a go on this, you, you lucky duck? <laughs> that is so interesting. Weird, isn't it? I love it. It's weird. What is this costume you have on? This is my uniform. I led the French victory at Toulon. What is your name? Napoleon. Has the course of my life just changed? Napoleon. The film really hangs around this relationship between Napoleon and Josephine, doesn't it? And it really, yeah. right from the beginning, it start, you get a sense that 
Josephine is sort of tolerating this kind of awkward, jumped up figure. Yeah, you do. And a lot of their history and the mystery that surrounds them is often packaged as that, is that Napoleon was the one that was like really invested, really intense, really over the top, like to the point where a restraining order might be <laughs> might be required at some point. And that Josephine is framed as being much cooler to this. She was older than he was. She was 32 with two kids and he was he was 26. And it's often framed as like almost that Napoleon was the last chopper out of Saigon for her, that she had to, <laughs> that like there was nothing else on offer. Yeah, and I never liked that framing of it. Because because, that, but that's interesting, is it? Because, yes, she had been the lover of other senior yeah. revolutionary figures yeah. and she kind of ended up with this Corsican because she was sort of falling from favour a little bit. I, I have heard that and I've yeah. read that and I know why people say that, but I also think she had, she had a lot going for her, oh, you know. Really? She was renowned as an absolute beauty, but more than that, she was charming and she was funny and she was intellectual. She was one of those people that just exudes charm and she absolutely captivated any room that she was in. I think that she could have, have found other opportunities, but you've also got to frame it within the fact that, well, she is a single mum with two kids. She's making her money, you know, by hustling, isn't she? she it's useful to think of it, I think, in terms of being a courtesan. How do they meet? They met at, it was after the French Revolution, it became weirdly fashionable for people who had survived it to get together. Again, like a post-traumatic stress thing, they would have balls and they would call survivors balls. And in the film, you see her with her hair cropped really short in the beginning. That was very fashionable amongst aristocratic women that had escaped the guillotine because obviously they'd cut all their hair off before they went to the guillotine. You see her with the choker on as well. That was like a status symbol because it represented the blade. She was there holding court. She was the mistress of a very, very wealthy man and Napoleon was there too and he was absolutely entranced by her. But her background was quite aristocratic. Yep. So before the revolution, she was part of France's ruling class. Yep. And it all, I mean, she has a tough revolution. She has a very tough revolution. So her husband, by all accounts, was a bit of a dick. He, um, and he was playing away and he wasn't very nice and he got guillotined in the revolution, which Karma. he didn't deserve. Even yeah, let's just clarify that. <laughs> no one even, deserves even this atrocity. For, yeah, to be to be guillotined. Although I imagine she probably wasn't crying all that hard about it. But she was one of many aristocrats that was rounded up and kept in jail, just waiting. They didn't know if they were going to be executed. They didn't know when they were going to be executed. People would come in and just take them out of the jail each day, and they'd just. Whoosh. And these conditions in these jails are horrendous. It's just loads of people, men, women, everyone piled in. They don't have enough food. It's dirty. It's crowded. And she was in there for a long time. Her husband was guillotined. She didn't know if she was going to be guillotined. And one of the things that you read about a lot in these conditions, now it wasn't just in French jails, all across. If you were pregnant, you'd get a stay of execution. It was called pleading your belly. And that meant that in jails, a lot of women would be trying to get pregnant. For of, that makes perfect sense to me. So there would be, there'd have been lots of sexual immorality, there'd been lots of abuse. There was, there's no human rights in a jail waiting to be guillotined. It would have just been horrific. And she lived through that. And I think a much more sympathetic portrait of Josephine, and maybe lots of people went through that, is that this is a woman dealing with what we'd probably call post-traumatic stress disorder. So she's older than him, yep. she's narrow scratch, she's done a lot of living. She has, and her name wasn't Josephine. Oh, really? No, she's gotten down in history as Josephine, but Josephine was Napoleon's name for her. Her name was Maria, and she went by Rose before she met Napoleon. He just, that was her name. Oh. One of her middle names was, was Joseph, Joseph. So I think that he, he seen, but he basically just went, I, I now give you a new name. <laughs> Your yes. name is now Josephine. That's extraordinary. <laughs> I wonder if that's partly him saying, I'd like to draw a veil over everything that's happened before now. I want you to be a new, I want there to be a blank slate. I mean, it might have been that. I mean, that's quite, I'd never thought about it before as a way of drawing a line under everything that had gone before, that she has a new identity, she's a new person to him. Whatever it was, she didn't seem to fight it. And she's certainly gone down in history as Josephine. But that was his name for, for her. And coming out of prison, she, yes, she has a, she's alive, but yep. her, her status in society is now dependent on 
powerful moment. Well, it is. She So she's an aristocrat, so it's going to be very difficult for her to go and get a job working down the supermarket, for example. She doesn't have that option to her. She has got a little bit of money. She's relying on aristocratic friends, but really what she needs is a wealthy protector. That was just the way this system worked. I think that she could have had other options. She Everyone was entranced by her. I think that she loved Napoleon a, a lot mm. more than is often allowed. I, I really do. Or she saw something she knew was going yeah. places. Yeah. She backed it. Don't tell me I'll see a surprise. Once you see it, you will always want it. This vermin has held the world hostage with his egotism and his lack of simple good manners. I've got some love letters from Napoleon to Josephine. December 1795, so early on, so he's not like an all-conquering hero. He's doing all right at this stage. Sweet and matchless Josephine, how strangely you work upon my heart. You start at midday. In three hours, I shall see you again. Till then, a thousand kisses. Mi dolce amore. But give me none back, for they set my blood on fire. He's good, isn't he? He's, He's good. I mean, it's a bit clockworky. I mean, what's wrong, you know, what's going on pre-midday? He writes to her obsessively, you know, like all the time. He writes to her about how he's thinking about her all the time and then he hopes she's thinking about him. And, oh, I know it's been two hours since I wrote to you last, but now I'm going to write to you again. He, he just... He can't stop it. He is obsessed with he this woman. He would have been a nightmare on WhatsApp. He would. He really would. OK, November 21st, 1796. So his career is progressing. A kiss on your heart and one much lower down. Much lower. I'm going to bed with my heart full of your adorable image. I cannot wait to give you proofs of my ardent love. How happy I would be if I could assist you at your undressing. The little firm white breast, the adorable face, the hair tied up in a scarf a la Creole. You know that I will never forget the little visits, you know, the little black forest. I kiss it a thousand times and wait impatiently for the moment I will be in it. To live within Josephine is to live in the Elysian fields. Kisses on your mouth, your eyes, your breast, everywhere, everywhere. You're the expert. What do you make of that? I think he was actually quite a good lover, you know. That implies he was a better lover than he's portrayed in the movie. He was a giver, but mind you... Because he's a taker in the movie. He is, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And it's it's quite abrupt. It's abrupt. It's Yeah, it's it's functional sex (laughs) in in the movie. But in his letters, he writes a lot about kissing her down, down, way below and about kissing her little black forest. And, I mean, you have to remember, these are letters, right? Like, uh, my inbox is full of texts of people going, I'm going to rock you all night, baby. And then it's like, well, that was over in five seconds and now you're in an Uber. Doesn't mean anything. I do know that. I do know that. It's very relatable. (laughs) He could, could, just because he's writing it, doesn't mean, Josephine might have been there just going, well, that was a lot of promising for for nothing. But if we're to believe his letters, he's very intimate. He wants... And he wants to give her head. That's that's mm. what's in in the letters. And would that have been sort of cult, like culturally normal at the time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that we're often surprised by people in the past having the kind of sex that 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 we have today. But why wouldn't they? I mean, I think what's unusual about him is that he writes about it so much in his letters. I mean, you know, it's not every single letter by a long shot, but the fact that he would even mention that, I think he's a giver, not yeah. a taker. He seems to be, like, absolutely devoted to this woman. And I think that the, the film, I I think maybe they, they did him down a bit there. I think he was a bit more of a generous lover than he's portrayed there. But then we'll never know, will we? He might have just been bigging himself up. Mm. The one letter that everyone's heard of, which is when he tells her not to wash. Oh. We, that You haven't been able to stand that one up, have you? Ah, uh, I wish that was true because it's such a good line and I think it really gets to like just the visceral fleshy realness of sex that I'll be home I'll be in Paris in three days don't wash or don't bathe or something that's attributed to him I can't find that actually in one of his letters I can find historians that write about it but when you go through their sources they've got another historian and another book and it's I can't it might exist, it, and I've just not said, but I, I've never actually seen... It doesn't have the Kate list of seal of approval. But he does write, I want to kiss you down, down, down below and talk about kissing her little black forest. So just because he didn't say that doesn't mean that 
that's not something that, that he was interested and in. And did he have a nickname for her vagina? He did. He did. Uh, Baron de Keppen. Right. Which is really, and it's really funny, but it's also, it's quite, it's like a really sweet, intimate thing yeah. that shows a really playful part of him. Mind you, I don't know who Baron de Keppen was. No, he, there he, might be a whole story there. <laughs> I mean, it might not have been a nice, playful Listeners, thing. At if anyone else can take a guess, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Baron de Keppen. <laughs> uh, what is interesting, it would not be the first couple this has happened to, or I suspect the last. As soon as they get married, their relationship seems to... Uh, Get slightly more fraught, <laughs> a bit less sexy. They get married in March mm. 1796, and there's a letter here in which he says, I have your letter the 16th and 21st. There are many days when you don't write. What do you do then? I'm not jealous, but sometimes worried. Come soon, I warn you. If you delay, you will find me ill. Fatigue and your absence are too much. Your letter's the joy of my days, and my days of happiness are not many. Because he's busy fighting the Austrians in Italy. He's not having a happy time. Is that a sense that she's not as into him as he was into her? We've got a lot of letters from Napoleon to Josephine like that. He's really upset that she hasn't written to him. And it's, it's a really interesting insight into this a brilliant military tactician. And some people think of as a tyrant, but a, a leader. And then you've got these letters where it, he becomes very much like a child. And he's like, why haven't you written to me? Write to me, please write to me. And he gets increasingly angry with her. And that bit of, I'm not jealous, I'm just just a bit worried. Yeah, honestly not jealous. Not jealous. And later that year he writes, I don't love you anymore. On the contrary, I detest you. You're a vile, mean, beastly slut. You don't write to me at all. You don't love your husband. You know how happy your letters make him. And you don't write him six lines of nonsense. And then slightly later in the letter he goes, soon I hope I'll be holding you in my arms. <laughs> then I will cover you with a million hot kisses burning like the equator. He's all over the place, isn't he? He's all over the place. I follow in the footsteps of Alexander the Great and Caesar. My destiny is more powerful than my will. He is. That, it's the the Napoleonic equivalent of leaving a message on red, isn't it? And then not getting. It is frustrating, but he gets all, like that level of anger at her. But we'll never know if that was like, was that playful? Was that like an in joke, or did he genuinely mean to call his wife and a detestable slut because yeah. she wouldn't write to him? And because he was actually worried about her. Having sex actually, other people. And he was well, he was perhaps right to have been. <laughs> well, see, so what what's going on at her end? What do we think is happening? She had an affair with um, a lower level up well much lower than napoleon because he was the top but a lower level army guy called ippolita charles and it became public knowledge napoleon was very very upset and when she went to visit him she traveled to see him she actually brought ippolita with her which is right. that's an interesting move on on her part i think but she was having affairs it did hit the press he knew about it and he nearly divorced her as well that's right so and actually the, it's that's portrayed in the movie isn't mm. it where he's in egypt and he does hear news i think from his brother but he does hear news mm. in egypt that she has been is being unfaithful to yeah. him yeah again though was that was that culturally it's france it's France. It's France. They're, they're rich. Like, he's having affairs. He was having affairs too, He's right? having loads of affairs. He had 22 yeah. at least that we know about. Oh, really? And, and a fair few illegitimate children. But, you know, patriarchy. So she's the one that's, <laughs> that's, that's held up and is, and is castigated and he nearly divorces her and, and she has to th literally throw herself at him and, and beg for him to take her back. And is, is it super embarrassing? I mean, is it public? Is it? Yeah, it's public. Is it? Yeah. It'd be pretty, it, no, it'd be embarrassing. It would for him too, not just for her. But um, yeah, there was huge public interest in this because he's the leader of the country and what you can't even keep your wife under control. You can't even satisfy your wife in the bedroom. It's, it's interesting in a way that he mm. takes her back. He really loves her. Yeah. He could have divorced her. He could have chucked out. Her, his family didn't like her very much. They didn't like her from, from the get-go. That was the perfect opportunity to have divorced her, but he didn't. And then there's the issue of, of sons and heirs, right? Yes. Which gets dynastic and gets even more complicated, as you've often talked about when it comes to like the dynamics of sex in, in a kind of in a, in a dynastic culture. He becomes emperor in 1804, mm. and he needs to start a dynasty. And it becomes this huge pressured 
thing. Why aren't there any babies? We need a baby. Let's have a baby. And a baby boy got to have a baby. And she's in her late 30s or 40s by the stage? She, let's see, she was 32 when they met. She'd already had two kids. Yeah. Yeah, she must be it must be late thirties, yeah. early forties by this point. No babies, and there was a big thing about who is it that can't get pregnant? Who is it? Is it, is it him? Is it her? His family were really angry about this and were pushing for a divorce from Josephine. I mean, they were from the very beginning, and then he gets one of his lovers pregnant. So then it becomes this: ha ha, it wasn't me. Uh, I, I'm fertile. I've just proven it. And in the film, they they play on that a little bit, but that really did happen. Not quite like it did in the film, but it was used as a, he's fertile, she's the problem, she's got to go. Sex and relationships is complicated enough, right? Oh, but then God. when you have to have a baby to ensure the continuity yeah. of a state, of an, a regime, then what is that? I mean, that adds a whole level to it, doesn't it? It becomes hideously transactional and about the law, and like people become more like farmyard animals, that, <laughs> like mm. with animal husbandry, we're trying to breed them. I, as opposed to any kind of romance, because now the, the dynasty and the and France is at stake here. I thought that was some great lines in the movie when he's like, "It's not me, it's not you, it's it's the it's what we need, it's France." Yes, it's France. This, sadly, it's what a shame. And it's I think they did it really well in the film. There's a kind of inevitability to it, and I guess there was in real life. Yeah. Like there aren't going to be any babies here. They're just they're, for whatever reason they're just the just not going to be babies. So now what do you do? And it's interesting, isn't it? Like, you could have different identities. She was she was a lover, she was mm. a wife, then she's an empress. And, well, hang on, if you're an empress, then you've got to be a baby machine. That's the rule. That's, yeah. I mean, it's really ugly, but that's it. That's, you've got to make the babies. And he stayed with her for so long, even though no babies were coming, and the pressure that he was under. And even when they signed the divorce and they, they separated and he went off and married a 19-year-old, he was still in love with her. He was still besotted with her. You want to be great, but you are nothing without me. Say it. I believe I speak for all of us. We will all sleep again without this vermin. Shh. Whose country are we in? The movie really captures that kind of tempestuous nature. They have these mm. massive fights, then she says you're nothing without me. And then you also see her kind of working rooms, don't you? And he's being awkward and, yep. and sort of genius-like. And, and she's clearly a politician. Mm. So I think yeah, they would have been a team. They were a fantastic team, actually. And they did have a really turbulent relationship. Many people did. But this was a time when people didn't really marry for love. They married mm. for, for, especially if you were rich, they married for political reasons, for alliances. But I think they really, really did love each other. They could have walked away from this several times over and they didn't. They had a really tempestuous relationship, and the film, I think the film does a really good job of capturing that, actually, that that switch all the time between we have responsibilities to France, but we love each other, and then who's actually in charge? He says to her that she's nothing without him, and then she says, you're nothing without me in a different scene, and it's this real tussle between them, and I think they nailed it, and what comes out of all of it is that these are two people that are just pretty crazy about one another. What's really interesting for me, you know, I've talked about this before, but like how, because the nature of people writing history and the, the generations that follow, they, they're not interested in that story, no, are they? So no. it is very hard for us to, to, to find source material for this, right? Because yeah. they, they, you have every single boot on the Battle of Austerlitz is recorded about exactly where it was <laughs> at exactly every point of the day. But none of the kind of blokes in the mid-19th century that are writing the first draft of history care about her influence on him and vice versa, right? It's, it's Not tough so to much. get there. I mean, they, 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 there's always been an interest in Josephine. She was very much the it girl of the day. She was a socialite. People were fascinated by her, by her hold over him. But no, people haven't been as interested in the did he really like to go down on a question as... as well, well. And also what role she played in his regime. Like, in yeah, his right? Role. Yeah. I mean, and she, she played an absolute blinder because she, he, he viewed her as the place he would go to to, I don't want to say calm down, but she was like this haven for him. He, she made him feel happy, and in the world that he lived in, that was pretty rare, I would have thought. You know, if you've just been seeing hundreds, thousands of guys having their legs blown off by cannons, you perhaps a bit of downtime is quite valuable. Yeah, he's a busy guy. He's very busy. And he's, and he's mentally very busy, like he, because even in between the battles, he's like writing law codes and organising oh, charters. It's for... the Napoleonic Code. Yeah. 
yeah, that was a bit of a... He did... There was a lot of good stuff that came out of the Napoleonic Code, but it wasn't particularly friendly to women. And I think that maybe Josephine playing away influenced some of that. Like, he made... Um, Husbands could divorce their wives on grounds of adultery, not the other way around. It was perfectly right for a husband to murder her, his wife's lover, not the other way around. So he sort of, he's, he obviously went, right, I'm going to make it illegal for you to do this ever again. And he really went to town with it. That's quite funny. So, mm. the, so the, uh, their, own, their own little drama is played out, playing out through the rest of French history. Yeah, yeah. This enduring legal code. Exactly. And, you know, you wonder how much influence Josephine had, you know, which, because he's writing to her these love letters, but I love you, I love you, I love you. And then there's little bits about, like, oh, I'm going into battle tomorrow, da 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 da, da. Like, this, like, huge military movements are, are being prefaced by a, please write me a letter. Yeah. And it's you kind of wonder, like, what influence did that have if his head isn't in the game, if he's all, why has Josephine written me a letter? You I'm not saying that's why he lost the Battle of Waterloo, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. I'm creeping towards the position that um, insecure terrified men should not be allowed to wield the power of life and death over the rest of us and control well, the course that, of history. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting yeah. point, yeah. And 200 years later, the equivalent of Napoleon, I've got nuclear weapons. So that is a really <laughs> exciting, really exciting thought. She is really upset about the divorce. She seems to have bought into the imperial mission, doesn't she, by think, that stage of the movie? And I think that's probably, that feels about right. Which... I don't think she had a choice. I, don't, I actually think that either of them had much... Much it's, of a choice about that. So you, you, you're like the movie's right, and when it goes, Napoleon goes, "We have to have a divorce for France." Yeah. So I thought that's quite. I thought it's quite funny, and mm. he's just projecting. He's well, he is obviously. He always assumes that his fate is that of France as well. Yeah. But I guess I guess it is true. I guess the the future of the regime and stability in France did depend on him having a kid. It did, and that's what it boils down to. And to, again, Josephine is often framed as, "Oh, poor Josephine, she got." Was it an old or divorced? I can't remember. But whatever it was, it was very public. It would have been very embarrassing. He's gone off so he can marry a 19-year-old. I personally think that, that she played an absolute belt there because she got to keep the title of Empress. He made sure that she kept all of her money, which, by the way, she spent like a drunken sailor. She lived in the Chateau Marmont, which was a huge palatial thing, absolutely loaded, and doesn't have to have sex with her whingy husband anymore. <laughs> Uh, what, what's, not to like. what's sad about that? And there's some poor Austrian princess has been ripped out of the Habsburg <sighs> palace and delivered to Napoleon, I know. Austria's most deadly enemy. Yeah. And she, but she bears him a son. And then there's that scene in the movie that I thought that can't be real. Napoleon does take the baby to go and meet Josephine. <laughs> it's extraordinary. <laughs> he's such, he's such a, boundaries do not exist for this man. He's such yeah. a klutz. He's just the idea that you know you've you've sent your your wife away, your wife of 15 years. She's now living pretty much in exile. She's been nationally humiliated, so you can have this baby. You're just going to rock up at her house and go, look, this is this is the baby you couldn't give me. Ta-da. For me, that just harks back. He hasn't evolved it's much amazing, since that first it? conversation with the, with the sex worker on the street. No. He's... He, he doesn't... Um, he doesn't no. seem to be able to... No, completely clueless, right? But that's probably why he was such a good military tactician. Not being clueless, but just not just being that pig-headed, that determined, that refusing to see other people's perspectives. As far, as far as he was concerned, there's a baby. He's really happy about it. Of course she'll be happy about it. He's happy about it. His affair that I'm most interested in is with the, with the Polish woman, Marie, I can't pronounce her second name. Vasilevska. Vash, what, what you said. <laughs> and, and we think that may have actually shaped his policy towards Poland. Mm. He, he kind of resurrects Poland as a political entity. I was really struck in the movie by Josephine's dalliance, mm. flirtatious relationship with Alexander, the Tsar of Russia. Yeah. And I thought, look at these Hollywood filmmakers talking nonsense. Looked it up. There are, that's actually, that is actually based on a, a real story at the time. That it was gossip at the time. Yeah. It, they definitely hung out. They, they did. definitely got on really well. They did. They did. Um, she was, was it nine years older than, than he was? Maybe even more than that, I'm not sure. But, yeah, they definitely... They caused gossip. Yeah. They did. They hung out. They seemed to get along very well. It was an interesting move on behalf of Josephine, that's yeah. for sure. And because unusually, 1814, Russian troops occupying Paris, so he's there, he's yep. the all-conquering hero... And they spend, like, a chunk of time together. They spend a chunk of time together in each other's house, in relative-ish privacy, enough to get the press talking. We don't know if anything actually happened. Now, in the movie, it's portrayed that that drives him so crazy, he basically mm. invades France and tries to get the throne back, which is kind of... That's probably overplaying it a bit, but 
it's, it must have been devastating for him reading those reports when he was stuck on his little know, island of Elba. He must have been absolutely furious about it. And in the movie, he's so pretty as well. Oh, the Tsar, yeah. he's pretty. Yeah. He's very, very pretty. Yeah. I'm not surprised that, that she would want to dance with him. But he must have been absolutely raging. He never, ever let go of Josephine, ever, even when they were, I suppose, forced to separate. Well, and death forced them to separate, Kate. Mm. Not wish to be too poetic here. Oh. It's because that's so interesting that she never saw him return to power in 1815, no. did she? No, she didn't. She pegged out slightly before that, bless her. And it, well, it, on one theory, it, would, it was said at the time she got cold walking around with the Tsar, trying to impress him with her off the shoulder yes. dresses. Yes. But that's malicious gossip, no doubt. But like, it's, she, it was around that time, so she, she, she falls ill and dies at this very dramatic juncture of, of history. I know. It's, she never got to see him come back. I mean, she was in her early 50s, I think, and it was a, an illness that came on quite suddenly. It's probably diphtheria. And it just, it just bam, which was uh, alarmingly common for the time. But yeah, Napoleon arrived back and, and she was gone. It's so... It's so sad, isn't it? It is sad. And it's, that line is so strange in the movie where he, he says to, Nap he says to Joseph's <laughs> yeah. kids, I don't blame I you. I don't blame you. I love that. <laughs> so that's such a great, weird, like really in keeping with the kind of he character they built up. The reports of what he was actually like when he found out that she died, I mean, he was a man destroyed. Was he, he was in pieces. He was, because he'd been away for such a long time and that she died without him and she died so suddenly. And, and he thought he was coming back to see her. I mean, imagine that, like you, you've traveled across oceans and you've built a fleet and you've commanded ships and you've, dis, you've disobeyed a government in part to come and see this woman. And then it's like, oh, sorry, she, she has died actually. And that's, oh, like, he was, beyond devastated. And then without his talismanic partner, he goes and loses the Battle of Waterloo. I love the framing of that, but I'm not quite sure. If not, it's... I'm not sure she, yeah, well, you know. But he was certainly very sad. He was a very different man in 1815 to where he yeah. was in 1805. And that's what, he, like he was, he was far less energetic, far more listless. He probably could have defeated the Prussians and the Brits if he'd been a little bit, shown a bit more activity. Do you think? After the Battle of Ligny, yeah, a bit niche there. But yeah, so I want, you know, that it all contributes, no doubt, right? To his mental state. And... I think his mental state deteriorated. I mean, what he'd been through, and the other thing the film got across really well is the instability of the political yeah. life. Like, all right, so you're on top of the world one minute and everyone's cheering you and giving you flowers, but the next minute yeah. the guillotine is out and they're chasing you through the streets. I mean, the stress of that. It would break anyone. I just think in general we're so poorly placed to judge these people in the past and really yeah. and try and get inside their heads because they'd seen trauma like we can't believe. You can't even imagine, like the stuff that he would have seen and, and regularly. Her, her and her. And her. And... One of the things they do in the movie is they list the number of casualties yeah. in the battles and you sort of get a scale of like, oh, like a million he's people. just used to walking across carpets of corpses. Right. Amazing. And then like the one thing that cheers him up is going out with Josephine and she's gone. I would put money on the fact he was thinking about her when he was on his deathbed. But even if it's not true, it's part of their mythology and it's part of the fact that we recognise how much he did love this woman. Kate, thank you very much for coming on and telling me all about Napoleon's sex life. It was my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I must warn you, I will not lead a second in command. I will win by fire. I am destined for greatness. I found the crown of France in the gutter and placed it atop my own head. <laughs>